Hello, yeah. Jacob. Hello there. Um, could you please tell me, in one sentence, what's Messianic Judaism? Messianic Judaism is the natural continuation of um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the prophets, Jews who have discovered uh, the roots of their faith within biblical truth. Uh, both religions, Messianic uh, Judaism and Christianity, I have accepted Jesus um, for the sacrifice for their sins. Mm -hmm. What is the difference? Well, as far as I'm concerned, Christianity is really uh, an offshoot of Judaism. I see one religion, if we really want to speak about religion, because I don't really believe in religion, uh, that Judaism is the one and the only thing. The fact that Gentile people have come to believe into the promised Messiah, which was promised to Israel, it's marvelous. And that's exactly what God promised Abraham, that he will be a father of many nations. And that's precisely the promise God gave Israel, that we as a nation will be a light to the nations and a blessing to all the families of the earth. So um, there is one religion and the Gentile coming to faith, grafting into what we call the olive tree and becoming one with the household of Israel through faith and the prophets bear witness to such marvelous work that God offer to all mankind if they only come through faith to embrace the faith of Israel. What would you say is the common denominator from a comparative point of view, of course, uh, between Judaism, Christianity and uh, Jewish uh, Messianity? I mean, after all, they all believe in a one God, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a common denominator. Is well, there more to that except for the one God? Well, the scriptures is the common for all those three religious Jews, Christians, Messianic Jews. The one thing that really common for the three groups is the Bible. Although uh, for the religious Jews is only the Old Testament. And the difference between the three groups is there is only one group that have come to really uh, be born of God's spirit, which is one of the greatest promises God given us. And, and that is the Messianic Jews. Uh, because the Christians, how are you going to look at the Christians? There is, uh, uh, from the whole Christianity, there is only 10%, maybe 20% of people who really understand who Jesus is and walk in the footsteps of Jesus and really have come to the final revelation of who he really is. 80% of the Christian world have no clue of who Jesus is and what is he all about. So, did, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank yeah. you. And the religious Jews, if they only came to really understand the new covenant, this would be an awesome thing. An yeah. awesome thing. Would you say Jesus was a, a deeply religious man? What, what, would you, what would you call religion? What is a religion? Okay, I really believe that religion is man-made. Man created religion, right? I believe Jesus is the, the, the love of God upon the face of the earth. He have uh, kept all the law, but he was really, he had nothing to do with the religious um, uh, plastic things of the way doing things, you know, because you have to do. For him it was life, life. And so if he was a religion, I don't think he was a religion at all. I think he was... You don't think he was religious? Uh, he, he, he dressed perhaps like the rest of the religious community back then. Uh, Do you think he, he kept the Ten Commandments? He didn't break any of the commandments, not only the Ten, the whole 613 commandments. He kept them all, otherwise he couldn't really be the Messiah. He couldn't really provide us forgiveness. He couldn't and, be the Redeemer. And you don't think that is part of the religion? All those commandments you think were given straight from God and none of them are man-made? 
right. What was given from God is God. I call that to be uh, spirit and life. And religion have taken that and dressed it up with man-made ideas. And that's what Jesus was against. And that's what I'm against about man-made ideas of the things which are spirit and life and love. Except for Jesus, do you think humans, Jewish people as non-Jewish people, are capable of keeping how many? 613 commandments. <laughs> well, it's like, it's like telling them, I'm making you to sin. No, the truth of the matter is that God make no one to sin, but God give us that law. This whole 613 commandments, he bring it, to, he give it to us in order for us to come face to face with the realization that we cannot keep it and we need salvation. We need redemption. What the law does actually, the law bring mankind, those who are really willing to deal with truth, the law bring mankind with their back up against the wall for them to realize that they cannot and they need salvation and they need redemption. And God didn't leave us to die in our sin. He gave us the high priest. He gave us the sacrifices and uh, the priesthood office. But then he have literally come to deliver us with the ultimate sacrifice. I'm Jewish. Yes. And, and I feel totally um, fulfilled with my religion. Why should I add another thing? What's lacking in my religion? That you that this messianic uh, Judaism can can offer me. Well, the fact that Judaism today doesn't really see their need for forgiveness of sin, it doesn't really mean that we are in the truth of God. God have a truth for mankind. He have given us the high priest, the altar, the sacrifices for forgiveness of sin that we might live a life in the spirit with him. So as a Jew, um, not really having this forgiveness, you are cut off from the almighty God. And the only way to be reconciled with God as a Jew, you need the work of God in giving us this ultimate sacrifice, Yeshua. And as a Jew, like every person upon the face of the earth, you need it. So what would you call the Day of uh, Atonement? I mean, we do ask forgiveness and we do come to realize that we, we are sinners on that day and through the whole year. Right, but when you go to Leviticus chapter uh, 16 and you read the command of God referring to the, to the Day of Atonement, you realize that basically that whole Day of Atonement is uh, providing a sacrifice for our sin. Today, when uh, the rabbis have imposed upon us fasting, which is okay and it's good because there is half a verse in that whole chapter that speak about uh, uh, turmoil your soil, your, your, your soul, S let your soul suffer. Uh, but the whole chapter, not half a verse, the whole chapter speaks about the atonement which God give us in the sacrifice which he really asked us to bring to the high priest in the temple and we don't really have any more, neither temple, nor the altar, nor the sacrifices. And the reason we don't have it is simply because God ahead of time have promised that the ultimate sacrifice will come. So when you have the Day of Atonement in the Jewish setting of our day, that's far, again, as far as the east from the west of what the Day of Atonement ought to be, according to scriptures, according to the law, according to Moses. Who killed Jesus? The world really need to know the answer to that question. It's neither the Romans nor the Jews. It is a gift from God. That's it. A gift from God. It wasn't tragic in history. It wasn't like some kind of a, a mistake, a tragic of a great man who've come and been by mistake uh, tragically killed. It is God given gift to the entire human race. That is the, basically the grace and the love of God for the human race. No one to be blamed, neither the Jews nor the Romans. 
Why was Jesus crucified? Out of all the deaths, God could have chosen something, any other thing. Why specifically crucified? Well, that was the way that uh, the Romans were killing people back then. This is, uh, that's why. I mean, if the, if, 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 the, if the Romans will stone people to death, then he will be stoned to death. We keep saying the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. Why is there a necessity for a sacrifice? Why does there have to be a physical sacrifice? Because God is holy. Holy, holy, holy is our God, the almighty God. And he cannot tolerate sin. Sin will not be in the presence of God. And what the holiness of God reject, his love cannot embrace. In other words, God wants to embrace us. God loves. I mean, God is love. Let's not forget that he's holiness, but he is at the same time love. He cannot love us and embrace us and indwell within us and make of us a habitation of his very presence apart from uh, sanctifying us. So in order for him to really come and dwell within us in the spirit, because God is a spirit, he's not a religion, he have come to provide us forgiveness of sin so he can come and embrace us with his love. That's why men need forgiveness of sin. Because but God sacrifice, isn't that a bit extreme? Adi, someone have to pay the price of sin. And the price of sin is death. Someone have to pay that. For example, you, uh, you go to a court, and the court really want to take you to jail, uh, they'll tell you. So if they you... take your freedom, they take your house, they take yeah, your car, the... they inflict pain, but, but the judge, kill, they but, take life. But the judge have the right to say, okay, I set you free, you pay so much and so much money, or this, that, or the other, and come God, who is the, who is the judge, and he just take our judgment upon Messiah. Right. Someone have to pay it. Every time someone has to pay sin, it is true in the physical world and it's true in the spiritual realms. Why is the spreading of the, of the word um, in such a need for an outreach? I mean, actually people from abroad who are not Jewish come over to, to promote a Jewish savior, a Jewish messiah. Yeah. Isn't, isn't it slightly odd? Well, you might look at it as odd, but it really is a mystery. The fact of the matter is that Israel as a nation was called to be a royal priesthood. The entire nation of Israel was called to be a nation, if you like, of missionaries, to take the light, the blessing to the entire universe. And in fact, we did it. We did it. Who? Took it's it slightly the, the opposite, isn't it? No, we didn't. They're it. coming to us to bring us no, the light, let me to bring you, us the light. Yeah, now, but let me take you 2,000 years back. Paul, his name is Shaul, John, Yohanan, yeah? James, Yaakov, uh, Petros, Shimon, they're all Jews. They have taken it through the entire earth to the point which is really arrived to the end of the earth, as God promised through Isaiah, that his salvation will be his salvation will be to the end of the earth. And the fact that Israel over these 2000 years have really uh, been blind, or if you like, set aside until the gospel reached the end of the earth, now God in his loving kindness, in his faithfulness to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, bring us back to the land as dry bones, and he, what can I say, bring the Gentiles to wake us up to the reality of what they have received from us. Why do we need them to come back to us with the word when we are the ones who sent it out? Why would they need to bring it to us? Well, we, take it, we took it out to them, but we've come blind to it. And so they're coming back to bring us something that actually belong we'll to us to begin. open our eyes. Open our eyes and this whole truth really belong to us to begin with. So they're coming to really open our eyes to something which we desperately need. What is the calling of the Jewish nation? Precisely that. 
what they're doing, should, we should be doing. Israel was called to be a royal priesthood, a kingdom of royal priesthood. Israel was called to be a light to the nations and a blessing to all the families of the earth. That is precisely the call of God on Israel. And we fulfill this with the apostles, with the first early believers. They took it to the entire earth, and now it's coming back to us. When you read the New Testament and yes. you read all the preaching of Jesus and you think to yourself, I wonder, I really do wonder if Jesus was alive today, would he preach that? Would he say after knowing that six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust, would he actually say a sentence like, turn the other cheek? Or all his preachings, maybe they were relevant for the time he lived in. Is it still relevant to today's life? May I remind you that at the time of Jesus, we had the Romans Empire. May I remind you that, that on, on that time, there was real, Israel was uh, under a great deal of pressures of enemy. And it was then that he says, give you other cheek. It wasn't like, you know, uh, now, as if now it's harder than then with the Arabs around about us, okay? Jesus comes to offer mankind another way of life. His kingdom is not of this world. And uh, to give the other cheek is only heroes can do. And hero you can do and you can be only with the Holy Spirit. Um, it's, it's not giving the, the other cheek from a point of uh, um, weakness. It comes from a point of, uh, wow, he said it. He knows what he says and what I trust what he says, and uh, it always work for the better. Now, when we speak about national issues, Israel as a nation, if we as a nation will give out a cheek, and which, with, which I think we do, I think Israel as a nation really gives her other cheek. There is no other armies upon the face of the earth who treat their enemy like Israel with silk gloves, I mean, with such uh, love, Israel as a nation cannot afford giving her other cheek, yet in many ways she does it, and I salute her for that. I salute Israel, the Israeli army, uh, because this army really walking in the footsteps of Jesus. I mean, if, the, if this was the Americans, they would just, or the Germans, or any other nation upon the face of the earth, they would just wipe away Gaza from the air and finish with them once and for all. Russia will do it very quickly, Britain will do it, Any China will do it, only the Jews, only Israel. And I salute my army for that. They send the best of their soldiers to pick only the terrorists out. How do you get to that question? It's an answer. But, uh, I want yes. to thank you very, very much. You've enlightened me. Thank well, you. God bless you. <laughs> yes. Thank you.